Hello Internet! Today I wanted to take a look at a, a way to improve a, a dice script that we made probably a few years ago now. Um, and so the way the dice script ended up working is we gave it a series of vectors and then it used a dot product to figure out which of those vectors was the most up on the dice and use that to kind of give you an idea of what you had actually rolled on the dice. And so uh, the problem with that is it's really easy to solve vectors for a six-sided dice um, and it's really hard to do that for every other kind of dice um, mostly because the 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 math gets more complicated and and you can work it out it's just not very easy and the the best thing about programming is you get to automate all of the things that are really boring um, and so that's what we're going to hopefully do here um, and so what i want to do is we get mesh metadata as part of rendering meshes in Unity. And so every vertex on a mesh um, is going to store a bunch of information about it. And that's going to be like where it is in space um, and where what kind of texture to draw there, what, what's its UV coordinate. But it's also going to have a normal, which is its direction that it's pointing in space. Um, so if I were to insert a cube, for example, um, I'm assuming each of these normals is going to have a direction. And so that should be up and then left, right, front, back, and down. I'm hoping. Um, this is an experiment. I haven't actually tried this before. Um, and so we're going to see if this works. And then if it does, we can expand this into, into something that's actually useful. Um, but for now, I just kind of want to experiment. And so I'm hoping to get a list of the vector, the, the normals up, and be able to collect things that are similar to one another. Um, and we may have different ways of solving what's, what's similar to one another. Um, and it gets more complicated, obviously, the, the more complicated the model. Um, so as you get like towards like 100-sided dice and, and beyond, uh, it becomes more complicated. But the idea with this approach is because we're taking the normals of our mesh, I ideally this should work for any mesh. Um, we shouldn't need like a, a normal-sided dice um, that's all convex. I think that's the way, the way to pronounce it. We should be able to have like concave meshes or like you should be able to make a dragon into a dice. Um, I don't know how that's useful, but it should be a thing that should be possible if this works. Um, so, so we'll, we'll see, I guess, and, and we'll, we'll see if this works. Um, so I, I, I guess, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get started. Um, so there's a few things that we need to do, and we're not going to cover them all here. Um, but the first thing I want to do is just pull out all of the normals. And so we're just going to create a... Um, what do we want to call it? A dice side calculator? Uh, I, guess, <laughs> I guess that that describes what it's doing. Uh, and so we're going to want to store a public, I'm going to make it public so I can see it, um, vector3 list. Um, so we're making just an array of vector3s of our um, dice normals. And so initially we don't need to do too much with this. Uh, what we do need, though, is a mesh filter, I believe. Um, so the mesh filter is what is actually going to store that. And I'm just going to say uh, require component uh, type of uh, mesh filter. And this just makes sure there's a mesh filter attached to this so that we can actually read it. Um, we could uh, not require this to be attached and just make this public or, or, or assign this some other way. But for now, this is, this is, this is going to work. Um, so we're going to get the component of our mesh filter. Uh, not like that. There we go. <laughs> and then in the, I guess in the start, uh, we can do something. Let's just say um, calculate normals. And so I don't know what this is going to do, but we're going to need to pass it in some sort of mesh. Um, so there we go. <laughs> and now we need to make that method. And it's going to accept a mesh and calculate some normals. And we want to store those in dice normals. Uh, I probably <laughs> should have done that first, but uh, I think it makes more sense to return the results rather than have them modify the object itself. Um, and that way we're going to let the caller figure out what to do with the results rather than force it to, to put them somewhere. Um, and this way we can kind of separate the storage of the data and how that data is represented and the operation that we're doing. 
Um, and, and so but hopefully by doing that, it makes it easier for us to test. And it also will make it a little bit easier for us to kind of implement this, I'm hoping. Um, if we were to bind everything together, if we ever wanted to change it, we're always changing that method and we need to retest both things. Um, but if we separate it like this, if I want to change how I'm storing stuff, I don't need to retest that I'm calculating normals correctly. Um, well, at least that's the idea. Um, you probably still want to, but it, you know. Um, so what we're going to do is do some link magic, I think, to uh, get everything out of this. Um, so we want to do grab the vertices. Not that. Uh, we can actually just grab the normals directly. Because So the way the mesh stores everything is there is a series of these lists that store different things. So uh, in this case, normals, um, there's probably colors, which is going to every vertex can have a specific color assigned to it. Um, there's also going to be a position or I guess vertices. No, that's something else. Uh, anyway, doesn't really matter. <laughs> what we actually want is, is, is the normals. Uh, and so we should be able to pull that out and assign that straight into dice normals. But I don't really want to do this uh, because we're going to get a lot of duplicates. If I, if I do do this uh, by did what I was saying I didn't want to do. There we go. Return this. It gets assigned there. We're good. Um, there's a few things wrong with this, but we can we can go ahead. We're not doing anything super bad, um, but we are slightly exposing things that we shouldn't be when we do this. Um, and I didn't attach it, so it's not it's not actually running. So uh, let's let's make it run. There we go. Um, and expand this so we can see what's going on. <clears throat> and then when we run this, hopefully. We get a whole bunch of stuff here, and we get four of each, it seems. Um, and that's because we have four points, each going in, in each of their directions. So this mesh has 24 vertices as part of it. Um, and it's got four going in all six directions. Uh, and so we can simplify this a lot by actually just doing some uh, distinct I believe is the function uh, we need link for that but uh, system dot link there we go uh, I guess it's not distinct that it might be unique no okay uh, less it is distinct what oh huh, that's why two array there we go uh, because because we're using link, it, it goes into an ienumerable type, and we're storing an array, um, and so those aren't compatible with one another. Uh, so we need to actually cast it back to an array, and that's actually going to force link to execute the function that we've created, which is effectively just removing all of the duplicates. Um, that might be weird. Um, vector threes use floats, and comparing floats for exact matches is typically not a great idea because they can be off by like very small fractions of a percent, um, especially when you get into like weird numbers, like 0.1 uh, is typically one of those numbers that is really weird. Um, and that's because it actually can't be represented in floating point notation. Uh, it, it's just not something that can be represented. Um, and so because of that, you end up getting like 0 0.099999 something. Um, or 0 0.01 something. Um, and, and so they're both really close to 0 0.1, but uh, they're not. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I said that wrong. But either way, um, this is working because uh, we have the exact values here. Uh, and so it seems fine. And so we get six values back out. And that's perfect. Um, but what happens if we do something a little bit less uh, normal, like a, didn't really think this far ahead, did I? <laughs> Let's do a cylinder and see, see what we get out. Like, again, testing stuff, not really sure what's gonna happen. We should get a lot more points here because uh, we're gonna get like weird numbers because it's, it's, a, it's a cylinder. <laughs> and so we get, we get all of this stuff um, and all of these like fractions are going to be each of the specific sides of our of our cylinder. And so we could leave it here 
Um, this is probably fine, actually, for for certain things. Um, it's gonna have a lot of issues with with other things, though. Um, like if you have any artistic stuff on it, um, or if your uh, values don't align exactly, you're gonna run into other issues. Um, and there's probably other uh, scenarios where you want to merge nearby things that are the same. Um, and we can do different things to kind of merge those. In this case, we're just merging everything that is distinct. Um, so if it's exactly equal to something else in it, it's getting removed. Um, but that isn't necessarily the best way to do this. Another way to do it might be to uh, combine them using normals, for example. Um, and how would we want to do that? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure it, figure that out. Um, okay, I, I think I'm making this up on the spot, so uh, bear with me. This might be a really bad idea. This might not work. Um, but what I'm thinking is we are going to sort the list of normals. And then what we're going to do is now that we have this sorted list, <clears throat> We are going to uh, take the first value and then uh, what do we want to do? Store the value. All right, let's add it to the average. Um, so the average is going to be just that single value at the first first step. Um, and then we're going to repeat, um, take the next value, calculate the dot product between the average and the next value. <clears throat> if next value is less than threshold, so if the difference between the next value and the existing average is less than some threshold, it's close enough. And so we should merge it into the existing collection of, of values that we're, we're creating. Otherwise, we should add something else. Um, this is going to, if, if this works correctly, we're gonna end up in this scenario with three sides. Um, assuming our threshold is, is large enough. We should end up with one for the top, one for the bottom, and then one for the entire outer, outer side because they're all going to slowly become close to one another. Um, that may not actually work because the average may get kind of weird once we get around to the, the end bit, but I, that's the best idea I have. So we're going to see how this works, um, and it, it might, um, and, and then we'll go from there. So if the threshold is, or if the next value is less than the threshold, add to average, um, repeat from step four. Sure. Um, else, um, <clears throat> start new value, clear average to new or to value. Uh, so effectively resetting the average to the new value and just repeating the steps. Um, and so since it's sorted, the, the important part of, the, of this is that it's sorted um, and this will only work on a sorted set of normals. Um, but because it's sorted, we should get, how are we going to sort this? <laughs> I didn't actually, I didn't actually think that out. Um, how do you sort a 3D list of vectors? Um, this, uh, <laughs> this, this may be more complicated than I was thinking. Um, <clears throat> cause you, you can't really do this, can you? Um, cause, cause how, how do you, how do you sort three, three vectors or, or three axes? Um, <laughs> How would we do that? We could sort it by angle, but but what angle? <laughs> um, okay, um, this doesn't work yet. I I need to I need to rethink this. The we could <clears throat> ignore this sort and take a value 
like take a random value and just start collecting all of the values over and over and over and over again until we can't anymore. Um, sort of like a like a um, what are they, what's it called flood fill or something, where we're where we're just putting a point somewhere and just saying fill every square that you can. We could do that with this and just say take the first point, um, <clears throat> and then find all the other values that can be merged into this, merge them and then find all the other values that can be merged into that new value and merge them and repeat for forever until you have an entire loop where you don't find any loop any any values and then at that point stop uh, and remove everything that was picked and go to the next thing um, <laughs> this that may be uh that's probably more work than I'm I'm prepared to do for this, um, because I I feel like I should probably actually work some of that out first and and see if it makes sense, because that's probably like a forty minute project, and it's something it's something that I'm probably gonna screw up at ten at night, um, so so that may be something that I'll look into in the near future, and I will leave this here. Um, if you're look if you're trying to use that dice thing. This might be a way to get to uh, at least a, a simplified version. It doesn't solve numbering things. That's probably something else. I don't know the algorithms for that. I don't know how that works. Um, but this will give you some quick way to actually add the numbers to those dice um, and, and solve that in like a programmatic way. And if you actually have a dice that matches whatever, um, what you can do is like we are outputting that list of uh, six sides. So if I add the cube again, put our dice calculator on it. Oh, hey, it worked. Oh, we're running. That's why. Um, but if I if I add this, we can actually take this and have this run not at runtime, but have this run as like an editor script or something. Um, and you can you can do that and and start mapping values to to these normals. Um, that that should be a thing that you can do. Um, this is just like a really quick implementation of like how to automate this process because it, it it's going to be tedious if you get into larger larger things. Um, and this actually gives you sort of sort of something. Even with that cylinder, it had a lot more lot more vertices than we were actually showing. So uh, I think that that's kind of handy. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this is helpful. And if you want to see us take this a little bit further and try to write like a, a edge merging thing, um, or if you have ideas on an, on something that's worked, or if you know of somebody who's done that, um, let me know and, and I can take a look because this is something that I, I don't really have a good idea on. I think what I have is going to be there, but it's not going to be very efficient and it's probably going to be, um, it probably is going to like overlook specific edge cases that we may want to consider. Um, like uh, one of the other things is like, if we're not dealing with a, a concave or a convex mesh, um, I said both types, that's not, that's not very helpful. Um, but if we're trying to deal with some complex mesh that has like overlaps, like a dragon, like I was talking about before, um, it may, I guess it, it isn't really a thing, but it's not going to consider if those things are near one another when it's considering them as part of the same side. Uh, and that may be something we want to consider as well. I don't know if that's something we do, um, but that would complicate things even more. So. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we'll 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 see where that goes. I'll I'll work on it and try to get something out uh, soon-ish. Um, I, 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 it it depends on how long it takes. But uh, yeah, I've rambled long enough. Let's uh, let's end it here, and uh, I'll I'll leave some code for this. So if you want if you want to play with this, go go for it, um, and and let me know what you do what what you do with it. Um, I will also leave a video or a link to the old video on the dice roller. That actually covers how to how to turn this set of values, these normals, into dice rolls and actually getting them uh, to work. So you can actually add a physics body to this, and it will actually tell you what the up value is. So what the most up of all of these normals is. Um, and that can be a really handy way of actually like rolling dice in a, in a game. If you want to make a board game uh, and you want to roll dice, this this is a way to do it. Um, so 
so yeah i'll leave a link to that uh as well but yeah thanks for thanks for watching and if you liked it give it a thumbs up uh it actually it helps a, a lot um, but uh yeah that's it for now so until next video see you, internet